Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel for a brand new Mystery with Molly. If you are new around here, if you have never seen my face on your screen before, then hi, my name is Molly. And I post true crime videos like this every single week. So if you think that that is something that you might want to stick around for, then please do subscribe. And don't forget to switch on the little notification bell so that YouTube will let you know whenever I post a new video. This week, we are going to be talking about the case of Melissa Witt. She was a young woman from the state of Arkansas who disappeared one night in the mid 90s. When Melissa went missing, of course, everyone was desperately hoping that she would be found safe and well, but tragically that wouldn't be the case. As Melissa had been the victim of a brutal homicide, a homicide which to this day, nearly 29 years later, remains unsolved. The police have never been able to identify the evil individual that did this to Melissa. But despite how many years have have gone by with no justice, this case is still actively being looked into. And I will fill you guys in on what is currently happening with the investigation today in 2023, a little later on in the video. And as always with the unsolved cases that I cover, I will leave some contact details in the description box to law enforcement in case anyone watching this video has any information regarding this crime. But quickly before we get into the case, please listen carefully to the following. This video is about the murder of a young woman and it involves heavy themes such as violence towards women, rape and sexual assault. Viewer discretion is advised. So for this week's case we are going back just under three decades now to late 1994 in the city of Fort Smith which is located in the state of Arkansas in the US. And this is Melissa Ann Witt. She was a 19 year old girl who lived in Fort Smith. Melissa who often went by Miss was born in 1975 to her mum Mary Ann and I couldn't actually find the name of Melissa's father anywhere. I'm not too sure whether or not Melissa had anything to do with her father as I know that her mum Mary Ann was a single mother and Mary Ann and Missy were incredibly close. They weren't just mother and daughter, they were also like best friends. I believe Melissa was Mary Ann's only child and Mary Ann was about 40 years old when she had Missy and she described how she had waited her whole life for Missy to come along. She described Missy as being her sweet angel. Mary Ann also described her daughter as being very kind and loving and one of Melissa's best friends, Tara, described her as being a very likeable and popular person. She had a lot of friends. She was very, very rarely seen without a smile on her face. Tara said that everyone just loved Melissa. There was no one that she knew of that had any problems with her. Her. She just wasn't the type to have enemies because she was such a nice, good person. She was also described as being very bubbly and quirky and also very intelligent. She was an honour student in high school and she attended the West Art Community College. And Missy also worked part-time as a dental assistant at a local dentist office, which she really enjoyed. She got along really well with her colleagues. They all thought so highly of her. She was so good with the patients and Melissa Melissa had decided that that was what she wanted to do with her life, the career path that she wanted to go down. In fact, she had plans to go to dental hygiene school in the near future. Melissa Witt was just a beautiful and genuine teenage girl with big dreams for herself. She was just 19 years old, so she had her whole life ahead of her. That was until early December of 1994, when her life, her future, was cruelly snatched away from her after she just suddenly disappeared one evening. The date was the 1st of December 1994. It was a Thursday and therefore a school day for Missy. So she woke up that morning, she got ready for the day and then before leaving the house to go to college she asked her mother Marianne if she could borrow some money because she was running low on cash and she told her mum that she would pay her back once she received her next paycheck from the dentist office where she worked. However, her mum, for whatever reason, said no and this apparently caused a little argument between Missy and her mum which I mean happens often doesn't it between parents and their kids. I remember arguing with my parents when I was a teenager when they refused to lend me some money. So yeah they had a little disagreement and then Missy left the house and she headed to college. After attending her classes that morning she went to a Chick-fil-A restaurant with a friend of hers and they had some lunch together and then after lunch Melissa went to the dental office where 
she worked as she had a shift that afternoon and then once her shift came to an end at around 5 p.m she got into her car intent on driving back home however she encountered some issues with her car basically her car would just not start it turns out that she had accidentally left her car lights on and so the battery was drained it was dead but thankfully some individuals came across her struggling to get her car to start and they were able to give her a hand and jump start the car for her so she was soon on her way again missy arrived back home at approximately 5 45 p.m and once she got into the house she realized that her mum marianne wasn't there but she noticed that her mum had left her a handwritten note which basically said that she was at bowling world which was the local bowling alley and that she would love it if missy came and met her there i think marianne was feeling a bit bad about the fact that she and missy had argued earlier that morning and so she said in this note come to bowling world and i will buy you some dinner i'll buy you a burger and so missy quickly got changed into some other clothes and then she got back in her car and she headed to bowling world but for some reason it seemed as though melissa never made it there her mum marianne waited at bowling world but her daughter never showed up marianne didn't really think much of it at first she just assumed that melissa had made other plans perhaps she had decided to go and hang out with friends instead and so when marianne left the bowling alley later that night and she arrived home she just assumed that melissa would be inside she'd be home however she wasn't there was no sign of her in fact melissa didn't come home at all that night marianne waited and waited for her 19 year old daughter to walk through the door but she never did and as time went by marianne just started to worry more and more like i said at first she just assumed that melissa was probably with friends but if that was the case then why hadn't she gotten in touch with her mum to let her know her plans it was so out of character for missy to not leave her mum a note or to call her letting her know her where about and so Marianne started calling Melissa's friends asking each of them if they were with Melissa however they weren't they all said they had no idea where she was and so in the early hours of the morning Marianne got into her car and she started driving around the local area looking for her daughter but again she had no luck and so at around 9 a.m the next morning this was the morning of the 2nd of December 1994 when there was still no sign of Melissa that that was when Marianne decided to call the police and file a missing persons report. A police officer arrived at Marianne's house shortly after and he began taking an initial statement from Marianne and just asking some questions about Missy and her life. Trying to find out what kind of person she was, trying to find out what she had been doing the day before, the day that she was last seen. Did anything happen that could be related to her disappearance? And it was during this when Marianne told this police officer about the argument that she and her daughter had had earlier in the morning that day the little bicker that they had because Marianne wouldn't let Melissa borrow some money and it appears as though as soon as this police officer heard about this argument he immediately jumped to the conclusion that Melissa was a runaway I suppose that she was still upset and angry at her mum for not lending her some money and so she decided not to come home and the officer just told Marianne that eventually she would come back and if that was the case if Melissa had gone off on her own accord then I guess she was well within her right to she was 19 years old she was an adult in the eyes of the law if she wanted to leave home and not come back she could so initially the police didn't seem to really take this case very seriously at all they didn't think that anything sinister had happened to melissa and so they didn't begin searching for her like i said they told marianne that she'd turn up at some point however marianne did not believe that for one second she did not believe that missy had chosen to not come home because missy just wouldn't have done that to her mum even though they would had that little disagreement she wouldn't have wanted to put her mum through that panic and that anxiety that just was not her so Marianne knew that something 
bad must have happened to her daughter and so even though the police weren't springing into action to try and find her Mary Ann was alongside other family members and friends of Melissa Mary Ann conducted her own search for her missing daughter they started asking around asking if anyone had seen her they created countless missing posters and they began handing them out and sticking them up in shop windows and on cars just doing everything they could to spread the word to make more people people aware of her disappearance so that there were more people looking out for her and due to this it wasn't long before the media picked up the story and they started reporting on the disappearance of Melissa Witt which was obviously a good thing very positive because again that meant the word was spreading quicker more awareness of Melissa's disappearance was being generated and pretty much everyone in the area and surrounding areas was learning about the case and it was after the media started reporting on it when there seemed to be the first big development in the case a man came forward saying that on the evening that Melissa Witt vanished the evening of the 1st of December 1994 he had been at Bowling World and at around 7 45 p.m that night he was in the Bowling World parking lot when he discovered a set of keys on the ground and on these keys there was a keychain with the name Missy on it. These were Melissa Witt's car keys. Now, of course, this man didn't think anything of this at the time. He just thought that someone had dropped them. And so he walked back into Bowling World and he handed them in to the staff, thinking that whoever had dropped them would go back to the Bowling World at some point to collect them. However, something he didn't notice when he first picked these keys up was that there were actually spots of blood on them, blood splatter. And it appears as though it was when when the Fort Smith police found out about this, found out that Missy's keys had been handed into Bowling World on the night that she went missing and that they had blood on them, when they realised that Missy probably wasn't just another missing teen who would return home in a couple of days, they realised that this case was probably a lot more serious than that. The blood on her keys suggested that she may have actually been attacked that night and the fact that her keys had been found in the Bowling World park parking lot clearly indicated that she had made it to Bowling World that night. She had gone there intending to meet her mum Mary Ann but she never made it inside. Her bloody key seemed to indicate that something must have happened to her literally as she arrived at Bowling World in the parking lot. But this set of keys wasn't the only belonging of Missy's that was found in that parking lot. Just two days after she vanished on the 3rd of December, Melissa's car car was discovered there too. Her 1995 white Mitsubishi Mirage was found parked in a space in the parking lot and it was immediately clear to the police when they found her car that there had been some kind of violent struggle around it because again blood was found. Pools of blood were discovered on the ground in different spots around the car and also leading away from the car. As I understand it there was like a blood blood trail starting by Missy's car and going through the parking lot and then the trail just ended abruptly where another parking space was. So due to this blood evidence the police's theory was that Melissa must have been attacked by someone as she got out of her car when she arrived at the bowling alley that night. They attacked her, she started bleeding and then they dragged her or they forced her to walk with them to their car and then they drove away with her in inside their vehicle. The theory was that Melissa Witt had been abducted that night and as well as the pools of blood the police also discovered a hair clip on the ground which was damaged, basically crushed, and one of Melissa's gold hoop earrings that she had in that night. It was clear that this earring and hair clip must have fallen out during the violent struggle with her attacker. Now unfortunately Bowling World didn't have any CCTV cameras installed at the time. There were no cameras covering the parking lot and so the police decided to appeal to the public and they asked for anyone who was at Bowling World on the evening that Missy was abducted to come forward. They wanted to speak to every single person that was there that night just in case they could have seen or heard anything, just in case there were any witnesses to her abduction and it turns out that there were. A couple of people came forward with information from that night which the police believed 
received was connected to this case. There was a young boy who came forward saying that sometime around 6.30 to 6.40 that night, he was at Bowling World with his mother and he popped out to their car to pick up a book that he had left in there. And he said that whilst he was in the parking lot, he heard the sound of a woman screaming. She was shouting, help me, help me. I don't think he saw this woman. He couldn't see where the noise was coming from, but he heard her yelling for how. Another witness report that came in was from another person who was at Bowling World that night, and they told the police that around this same time, around 6.30pm, they saw a young woman arguing with an African-American male in the parking lot, and this witness said that this young woman looked incredibly similar to Miss Wick. And so a composite sketch of the man she was seen arguing with was created and released to the public. In addition to that, another member of the public, a young woman, eventually came forward saying that she also heard the sound of an argument in the parking lot that night. An argument between a man and a woman and she recalls how the woman was saying things like, leave me alone and go away. And the woman who heard this said that from what she could hear of this argument, it sounded like the two people arguing arguing knew each other. It didn't seem as though it was two strangers arguing. It seemed like this woman who was shouting, leave me alone, knew this man. She said it sounded like an argument between a woman and her partner, and that the woman didn't sound like she was necessarily scared. She was kind of just matter-of-factly saying to this man, go away and leave me alone. And so for that reason, I'm guessing that she just didn't think much of it at the time. She just assumed that it was an argument between between a couple. And it wasn't until later when she heard about the disappearance of Melissa Witt when she thought she should probably report this to the police as the woman actually realised that where she heard this argument in the parking lot was right by where Melissa's car was later found abandoned. Now the police actually had this woman hypnotised to see if she could remember anything else about what she heard that night, if she could remember what else was said in this argument, like a name for example. If this was Melissa that she heard arguing, did she say the guy's name who she was arguing with? Perhaps she knew him personally? And I don't actually know if anything significant really came out of this hypnosis, however this woman has said that since that night she's had times when she's just suddenly woken up in the middle of the night in a panicked state saying his name starts with a D, his name starts with a D. She has had dreams that whoever attacked Melissa that night had a name beginning with D. So those were the witness statements that the police were pretty sure were connected to this case. They believed that these three members of the public were witnesses to what happened to Melissa that night. And as well as looking further into these tips and leads, the police were also looking into known sex offenders in the area and questioning them to try and determine whether or not any of them could have been responsible. They interviewed and took statements from countless people and as does happen in cases such as this, rumours started to circulate around the area. Rumours about Melissa and her life and people started to develop their own theories as to what may have happened. For example, apparently there was a rumour going around that Melissa was involved in drugs and that she owed drug dealers some money and so they kidnapped her and were holding her hostage. There was a rumour that they had taken taken her out of the state. So the police started looking into this theory, however I think ultimately they concluded that it was just a load of rubbish. Melissa was just not the type to be involved in drugs. She was very religious and dedicated to her studies and her work, so it just wasn't her thing. It literally was just a rumour. And unfortunately every other theory and every other tip and lead that the police received in the case were pretty much just dead ends. The police would follow them up but nothing really seemed to bring them any closer to finding out what happened to Melissa. They didn't know if she was still alive and as I said being held hostage somewhere or whether she was sadly deceased. Or at least that was until more than six weeks after Missy went missing when the Fort Smith police received the news that a dead human body had just been found. The date of this discovery was the 13th of January 19 1995 and
and that morning at around 9.40 a.m., two men, two animal trappers, were walking in the Ozark National Forest in Arkansas, which is just under 50 miles away from Fort Smith. They were walking in the forest about 15 miles north of Ozark when all of a sudden they spotted what looked like a mannequin on the ground, roughly 30 feet away from the main road. So the men walked closer to this mannequin in the forest and as they did so, they realised that this wasn't a mannequin after all. They had actually found the dead body of a young female. She was lying face down on the ground, she was naked and she was pretty badly decomposed by the time she was found. It was clear that this poor woman had been dead for a while. So these two men immediately called the police to report this discovery and it wasn't long before the Fort Smith Major Crimes Unit was at the scene. And as soon as the police were notified of this discovery, they immediately had their suspicions that this body in the forest was probably that of missing Melissa Witt. Although they weren't able to confirm this just by looking at her body because, as I said, she was very decomposed by the time she was found. But eventually, DNA and dental records did confirm what the police had thought, that this body in the forest was, in fact, Missy Witt. And her autopsy confirmed that she had tragically been the victim of foul play. Missy had been murdered. Her official cause of death was found to have been asphyxiation by strangulation. She was strangled to death. However, she'd also sustained an injury to the side of her head where she had either been hit in the head or possibly pushed to the ground and she banged her head on the floor. And something that the medical examiner found in her autopsy was that her airway showed that she had been inhaling dried grass and other debris which was apparently native to the place where she she was found, the Ozark National Forest, meaning that she must have been alive when she was taken to the forest. The forest was the place where she died. So based on the findings in her autopsy, the police's theory was that Missy was abducted, obviously from the parking lot outside of Bowling World, and it's believed that that's where she sustained the injury to her head. The killer hit her over the head, hence why there were pools of blood in the parking lot, and then they either dragged her to their car or perhaps carried her to their car. Maybe the head injury knocked her unconscious. But the trauma to her head was determined not to have been fatal. She wouldn't have died just from this head injury alone. So after abducting her from the parking lot, the killer took her to the forest and that's where she was strangled. It's believed that Missy was probably also sexually assaulted by her attacker, although this couldn't be 100% confirmed because of the fact that her body was very decomposed but of course she was found naked so it did seem extremely likely that she had been the victim of a sexual assault too. And the clothing that she was wearing on the day that she disappeared was not found with her remains so the other one of her gold hoop earrings was missing. Obviously as we discussed earlier the first earring was found in the Bowling World parking lot. Her Mickey Mouse watch was missing, her shoes and her purse were missing and also her jeans and underwear too. So perhaps the killer had disposed of those items elsewhere or he kept them as like a sick trophy, a reminder of what he had done and those items have never been recovered to this day. However, although her clothes weren't found, the police did spot a couple of cigarette butts near her body. So they wondered if perhaps these had come from the killer and they were collected as potential evidence and it was determined that Missy had in fact been murdered on the day that she went missing. So whilst everyone was out searching for her, desperately hoping that she would be found alive for those entire six weeks, she was in fact lying dead in the Ozark National Forest. Although having said that, evidence at the crime scene indicated to the police that Melissa's body had actually been moved shortly before she was found. So as I said, when the two men, the two animal trappers, found Missy. She was lying face down on the ground about 30 feet away from the main road. However, these same men who found her body told the police that just the day before they made the horrifying discovery, they had walked along this same spot and they didn't see anything. Melissa's 
body wasn't there then, so she had recently been moved. It's actually believed that at first, Melissa's body had been hidden behind this big rock in the forest. It almost looked like a headstone, and there were apparently indentations behind this rock, which suggested to the detectives that that's where Melissa's body was initially placed, and then she was later moved by someone, by the killer most likely, closer to the main road. Possibly because the killer actually wanted her to be found. Who knows, perhaps they were enjoying seeing all of the media attention that Melissa's case was receiving and they wanted more. They wanted more coverage of the case and they knew that if Melissa's body was found, they would get that coverage. They would get that attention. And just as a side note, there were apparently drag marks on Melissa's body from where she had been moved and there was no evidence at all to suggest that she had been moved by animals. It was clear due to the drag marks that she had been moved by a person. And once Melissa's body was found, it did make the police question whether or not a phone call that they had received just two days before the discovery could have possibly been related to the case and where Missy's remains had been hidden. You see, on the evening of the 11th of January 1995, a call came in to the Fort Smith Major Crimes Unit it after hours. So I don't think there was anyone around to pick up the phone, but the caller left a voicemail. On this voicemail, the police could hear the voice of a woman. She had what sounded like a southern accent, and they could hear that she was talking to someone else, a young man, possibly her son or her grandson. The woman was heard on the voicemail saying to this young man, quote, go ahead and tell them what you found. And also, are you going to get over here and tell them what you know? to which the young man responded, no, I can't. And then after this, the line went dead. The caller hung up. And it was after hearing this voicemail and after finding Melissa's body, when the police began to wonder whether or not this call could have been connected to the case. Did the young man on the voicemail know something about Melissa's death or the location of her remains? Is that why the woman said to him, go ahead, Head and tell them what you found. Was this young man actually the one who found Missy's body first? Was he the one who moved her? Perhaps he wasn't the killer, but he just moved her body closer to the main road so that she would be found, but he was too scared to call the police because maybe he thought that they would think that he had something to do with her death. Of course, this is just speculation. We don't know what that voicemail was actually about. And according to one source, at the time, the police were unable to trace the caller because apparently they had no caller ID in the major crime unit office or something. But yeah, that is a possible theory in the case that the young man from that voicemail may have been the one to move Melissa's body. But another line of inquiry that the police tried to follow up on after the discovery of Melissa's body was a lead that they had received from a member of the public. A man who lived locally got in touch with the police and he informed them that on the 4th of December 1994, so just a couple of days after Missy went missing and was murdered. He was out hunting in the forest and he said that whilst he was there, he saw another man standing on the road very close to where Missy's body would later be found. And the witness observed this man literally changing out of his clothes. He took off the clothes that he was wearing and he put some new ones on. The witness described this man as being aged probably somewhere between his 20s and 30s. They said that he had blonde hair which was curly and that he was around 5 foot 11 and probably weighing around 180 pounds and the witness also said that this man was standing next to a dark colored car. He believed it was either black or a dark gray colored car and that there was either a blue or purple decal sticker on the rear panel of the passenger side of the car and as well as the fact that this man was changing his clothes the witness also thought that this man seemed seemed a bit strange because from what I can gather back then most people who went to the Ozark National Forest went there to hunt but this man didn't seem to have any hunting equipment with him so 
why was he there and why was he changing his clothes? Could this man possibly have been Missy Witt's killer and he was changing his clothes because of perhaps blood evidence that was on them? As I said, the police tried to follow up on this lead. They tried to identify this man and they appealed to the public and released a composite sketch of him. But unfortunately, they had no luck. And to this day, they don't know who this man seen in the forest was and whether or not he had a connection to this case. But one thing the police are pretty certain about the killer is that he knew the area well. He knew the Ozark National Forest well because it was very remote and rather secluded. And it's been described as one of those areas that is hard to find and kind of navigate your way around unless you know it well and you've been there a number of times. And it's believed that the killer was obviously also very familiar with Fort Smith, where Missy lived and was abducted from. Again, they may have lived locally, which as you can imagine, just terrified the community that lived there. The thought that there was a killer living amongst them, a killer that the police didn't really seem to be close to catching. They weren't sure on people of interest, that wasn't the problem. The police received countless tips and calls from the public with names of potential suspects, but ultimately the police could never find any solid concrete evidence to definitively link anyone to the crime. And tragically, as the months and the years went by, this case remained unsolved. And Missy's friends and family never received any answers as to who did this to Missy and why? But there have been two kind of main suspects in the case over the years, one of which was a man named Charles Ray Vines, otherwise known as the River Valley Killer. He lived in Fort Smith in Arkansas and he was responsible for the brutal rapes and murders of two women. 58-year-old Juanita Woford, who was killed in her own home in June of 1993, and 74-year-old Ruth Henderson, who was murdered two years later in August of 1995. However, Vines wouldn't actually be caught for those crimes until five years later in the year 2000, after he was arrested for the rape and assault of a 16-year-old girl. And following this, he was linked to the murders of Juanita and Ruth, which obviously happened years earlier, as well as the attempted murder of another elderly woman, 89-year-old Lily. Lily Jones. He agreed to give a detailed confession to his crimes in exchange for the death sentence to be taken off the table. He didn't want to be put to death for what he did and so instead he received three life sentences without the possibility of parole. And when Charles Vines was caught in the year 2000, the police investigating Melissa Witt's case began to wonder whether or not Vines could have been responsible for Missy's murder too. And so they went to speak with him, the lead detective in Melissa's case, J.C. Ryder, who was the captain of the Fort Smith Major Crimes Unit, went to speak with Charles Vines in prison about Missy Witt. However, he completely denied it. He said that he was not responsible for Melissa's murder and the police never found any evidence to prove that he was lying, so they couldn't charge him. And to be fair, Detective J.C. Ryder has said that he thinks Vines was telling the truth about that. J.C. Ryder doesn't believe that Vines was involved in Melissa's case based on the answers that he gave to questions in his interview. And Charles Vines is dead now. He passed away while still in prison in 2019. Another big suspect in the case was a man named Larry Swearingen who was convicted of the rape and murder of a young woman in Texas, which occurred in December of 1998, just four years after Melissa Witt was killed. And the reason the reason why Larry Swearingen became a suspect in this case was because there were a lot of similarities between the murder that he was convicted of and the murder of Melissa Witt. Literally so many similarities. Firstly, the victims had the same name. The girl that Larry Swearingen killed was also called Melissa. Her name was Melissa Trotter. Both Melissa Trotter and Melissa Witt were the same age when they were killed. They were both 19 
scene. They were both college students. They were both strangled to death. Their bodies were both found in a forest. As we know, Melissa Witt was found in the Ozark National Forest in Arkansas, and Melissa Trotter's body was discovered in the Sam Houston National Forest in Texas. They were both killed in the month of December, I believe just a week apart. And also a lot of people think that the girls look very similar as well. And the police investigating Melissa Witt's case discovered that at the time of her murder, Larry Swearingen was actually staying with relatives in another area of Arkansas. He was staying in Clinton in Arkansas, which is just under a two and a half drive away from Fort Smith. So for all of these reasons, the detective theorised that perhaps before killing Melissa Trotter in 1998, Larry Swearingen murdered Melissa Witt just a couple of years earlier. And according to sources, something that was later found in his cell in prison was actually a load of paperwork. I think like news articles and things about the Melissa Witt case. He had been reading into Melissa Witt's murder. Could that be because he was her killer and he wanted to keep up to date with the investigation to try and determine whether or not the police were close to catching him for that crime. When asked if he had murdered Missy Witt, Swearingen said no, he denied it. And again, the police never had anything concrete to tie him to the crime, and so they couldn't charge him. And just like the previous suspect we talked about, Charles Vines, Larry Swearingen is also now deceased. He received the death penalty for the murder of Melissa Trotter, despite the fact that he always maintained his innocence in that crime too. And he was executed by lethal injection in 2009. And just two years after this, in March of 2011, Melissa Witt's mother, Marianne, also passed away at the age of 75. She died having never found out the identity of her daughter's killer. And to this day, the rest of Melissa's family and friends still live without answers. The case remains unsolved. No one has ever been convicted for her brutal murder. But this case is far from a cold one. As I said earlier, it is still being looked into to this day, nearly three decades after the crime. There is currently a $5,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and the conviction of the murderer. And the police are still looking into any and all tips and leads that they receive from the public. Even Detective JC Ryder, who was the lead detective on this case in the beginning, is still looking into it, despite the fact that he is retired now. Now, but he volunteers his own time now to try and help find the killer. Less than two years ago, on the 27th anniversary of Melissa's death, the police held a press conference in which they announced to the public that they hadn't given up. They were still fighting to get justice for Melissa. And I believe it was also around this time when new billboards with Melissa's face on were created and put up in different areas in Fort Smith. And one person in particular who has worked at tirelessly on this case and still works so so hard to try and spread awareness of the case to this day is a woman named LaDonna Humphrey. LaDonna is an investigative journalist and advocate for victims of crime and she was the founder of Let's Bring Them Home which was a non-profit organisation created to help find missing adults and provide support and resources to the families of missing people. She was just 21 years old when Melissa Witt was murdered and despite the fact that she never knew Melissa personally, she always felt this very, very deep connection to the case. And as the years went by and Melissa's case remained unsolved, LaDonna knew that she had to help, she had to do something to try and keep Missy's case in the public eye and bring as much attention to it as possible because of course the more people are made aware of the case, the better chance the police have of solving it. I believe LaDonna first began actively trying to get involved with the case around 2015 time. She got in touch with the Fort Smith Police Department and she got to talk with some of the detectives involved with Melissa's case, including Detective JC Ryder, who she now has regular contact with. She was granted permission to have a look through Melissa's case files and in 2022, she published a book about Melissa's case called The Girl I Never Knew, Who Killed? Melissa Witt. She set up a Facebook page to try and spread awareness of Melissa's case through social media.
media. Today, the Facebook page has more than 14,000 followers. And I believe she also set up the Who Killed Melissa Witch website, where you can actually make a donation towards funding the search for answers. At the moment, they are trying to raise money for a postcard campaign. They want to create 100,000 postcards, which will have information about Melissa's murder on. And they intend to distribute these postcards to houses in both the Fort Smith and Ozark areas in Arkansas, as well as to the prisoners who are being held in the Arkansas State of Corrections, just in case a convict might have any information about this case. And as well as the book, LaDonna and her team also created a documentary about Melissa's story. The documentary is called Uneven Ground, and it was released just this year, I believe, in 2023, again, to try and spread awareness of the case. I did watch the documentary as part of my research for this case and it is absolutely incredible and so so informative so I will leave a link to where you can watch it in the description box as well as a link to LaDonna's book and the Facebook page and the website I really take my hat off to LaDonna what an amazing woman she is to be doing everything she possibly can to get justice for Melissa to get justice for a girl that she never even knew and I really believe that she and the police will find the answers one day hopefully one day soon. Sometimes in these unsolved cases it just takes one person, the right person, hearing about the case and coming forward with information that could crack it wide open. So LaDonna is just trying to spread the word, spread awareness as much as she can so that hopefully they can find that person, they can find that one lead that could be the breakthrough. Now some of you may be wondering whether or not the police were able to obtain any DNA evidence of Missy's killer which could be compared against potential suspects in the case and unfortunately there isn't really much information online about this but I did come across one source, one article from 2021 which was written by LaDonna Humphrey and in it she says that there is DNA evidence in the case however as I understand it she isn't really able to say much more than that, say what kind of DNA it is probably because the authorities have to withhold certain pieces of information when a case is still unsolved. But I'll read a quote from LaDonna from this article to you now. So she said, I am frequently asked about DNA evidence in the Melissa Witt case. Yes, there is DNA evidence and there is potential DNA evidence. However, due to confidentiality, I'm unable to elaborate further. DNA evidence has been examined in this case. It has been examined twice. In fact, due to advances in technology, evidence is currently being tested for the third time. She has also said that the DNA evidence in this case is complicated. However, unfortunately, I don't know exactly what she means by that because, again, she's unable to say much. But she has said that she firmly believes that eventually the DNA evidence will be the key to helping to solve this crime. And until then, she plans to just keep doing what she is doing, keep spreading awareness of the case as much as she can. And of course, I will keep you guys updated if and when any news about this case is released. I will definitely be checking if there are any new developments in this case often. And if anyone watching this video has any information about the murder of Melissa Witt, then please get in touch with the Fort Smith Police Department. Their contact details will be on the screen right now and in the description box. And there will also be a link in the description box to the donation page if you would like to contribute towards the postcard campaign that I mentioned a few minutes ago. And that concludes this case. That is the unsolved case of Melissa Witt. I really, really hope that this case will be solved one day soon because, what is it, nearly 29 years with no answers and no justice? That's just too long. As always, please do let me know your thoughts and opinions on the case in the comments down below. I would love to hear what you guys think. And also feel free to let me know of any other cases that you would like to see me cover on this channel. They can be unsolved cases, solved cases, serial killer cases, you name it. Thank you all so, so much for watching. Please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you again next week for another mystery with Molly. Bye.